like, and if it has a smell, that smell is Voldemort then. So is it that he's not washing Voldemort's face or maybe he's just not brushing Voldemort's teeth? Hello, everyone. To our new listeners, welcome. To our old listeners, welcome back. We are the Perspective Potterheads, Jenny B and Terry T, and we are here to discuss our favorite fandoms, starting with and primarily featuring Harry Potter content. So if you like our content, like it, and if you love it, share, subscribe, and support. Today, we will be covering Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Chapter 8, The Potions Master. Well, today we're going to be talking about book one, chapter eight. We will also sprinkle in facts from every book throughout the series, the movies, Fantastic Beast movies, maybe some other books. So spoilers, spoilers, spoilers ahead. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, pick it up, read it with us. It's fantastic. Yes. So I just noticed when you opened the page there, and I didn't notice this when I read the chapter, but the Potions Master picture there is the book. It is the Potions book. And now that you say that, I wonder what Potions book is that? Is this? Of course, it's got to be the Prince's book. Is this the Half-Blood Prince? Is this like an allusion to later? I, it has to be. Like I, when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, it is. That's, that's amazing. Even in the illustrations, she gives us little tidbits, right? I noticed that actually when I was at the hospital looking at my book and I just like the, this, where you could see like the three headed dog over here Mm -hmm. and the unicorn running by. So, and I didn't look at the back of the book, but now that I do, that's gotta be Dumbledore, right? In this, in his purple cloak and his long beard. See the back of my book is different. Oh, is it? Oh, I always thought this might be Flamel. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't think, I don't know if it is, but that's who I always thought it was. I was like, it's Flamel, but it could be Dumbledore. So the potions master is the master, like not professor. And I just thought that that was interesting because I don't know. (laughs) I, um, I I was, you know, this chapter was interesting. I realized that like, even though the title is the potions master it, potions is only like two pages of it. Like it's right. not a lot. It's a lot of this chapter is a lot of like, this is Hogwarts. Welcome. I guess we could just kind of jump into it. Cause there's just so much stuff. Like first thing whispers follow Harry. The minute he walks out of that dormitory. Yeah next to the tall kid with the red hair. Did you see it? Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? Like, and I can't imagine what it would be like to be, to have all that attention on you. So I don't think I've ever, I'm usually like the one who hangs out with the friends who get noticed and people always refer to me as Oh, one of the cats just got in. <laughs> people always refer to me as so-and-so's friend or like oh yeah that girl like nobody ever knows me for oh that's that per you know oh it's link i thought it was zelda no it's link zelda is too shy to be around anybody else (laughs) so she stays in the bedroom most of the time and i am in the other bedroom oh link what are we gonna do with you i guess you're just gonna be in in the video just gonna be our harry potter cat for the day my cat's in here too, but she's sleeping. She probably will not move the whole time we discuss. So Harry does say he wished they wouldn't do it because he's busy. Like he's trying to figure this out. He's like already confused and lost. And now he's got all these people like staring at him. Yeah. Um, because there are 142 staircases in Hogwarts. Wide and sweeping then- ones, narrow rickety ones. <laughs> and there are doors because... Like, so when, when they're trying to force their way through this door and they get caught by Filch Mm -hmm. and at first I'm like, uh, duh, if the door doesn't open, like don't go through it. But then there are doors that pretend to be doors, doors that you have to ask secret things, doors that you have to tickle. Like, I'm sorry. I have to close my door because my, because now that the cat isn't here, Matt is interrupting with his Rick and Morty reference on fake doors. A few moments later. All right. 
doors that you yeah. have to ask politely. And sometimes they're not doors. They're just wall pretending. Right. So, so I could totally see why they are still trying to like force their way through that door. Mm -hmm. But then, but that just seems so confusing. Like, how do you know which doors are those doors that you are fake doors? Cause it could have just been a fake door. You just have to learn. It's a learning (laughs) curve. Um, I do think it's interesting and you know, how Rowling throws these things in that aren't relevant and don't come up again for several books, Mm -hmm. but I found one in this chapter. Um, with some with a vanishing step halfway up that you have to remember to jump. Yes. That vanishing step doesn't get mentioned again until the fourth. Yeah. And I think, and it arguably there is a little bit of plot twisting in that, that if Harry hadn't fallen in the vanishing step, he probably would have unveiled that Moody was mm-hmm. an imposter. Right. So, and it's, and it's weird because he is there for four years and it's like, he's just so preoccupied. He misses that step. Come on. It's a plot device. We all know it, but it was interesting. Like, I, I mean, again, yeah. I, I just, it's just one of those things that, oh, it's just randomly mentioned, but it does come up later. Right. So what I actually thought you were going to say was one of those things where she just writes things in that you don't think are going to be noticeable, like mean something until mm-hmm. later. I thought it was going to be that they were rescued by Professor Quirrell. I did note that they're rescued by Professor Quirrell. And I'm like, what's Quirrell doing there? See, that's the thing is like in the, and Snape is the biggest red herring throughout the books, but it's like, it's got, we've got these clues. And I think this is the first one we get about Quirrell being on that floor. Mm-hmm. Like why is Quirrell there? And you wouldn't even think anything of it. Quirrell was just passing by. Mm-hmm. And this doesn't say his first name, I don't think here, but all of the teachers, well, not all of them, but a lot of them have alliteration in their names. Mm-hmm. And I like, I don't even know how to pronounce Quirrell's first name, but I know it starts with the Q, but we got Severus Snape, um, Minerva McGonagall, Peeves the Poltergeist, Nearly Headless Nick. Like there's, you know, there's a, a, there's of a bunch of alliteration, the uh, Parvati Patil, like mm-hmm. it goes on and on. What is Quirrell's first name? It starts with a Q, but I can never remember what it is. Hmm. That's one I don't know. So Um, we do get a lot of characters. We get to, you know, Nearly Headless Nick pops up again. Um, Peeves. (laughs) How rotten is Peeves? Like he is sure, he exists surely to cause chaos and mischief. Like, throwing chalk at them, pulling rugs out from under your feet. Like in later ones, he was going to drop a a stone bust on somebody's head. Yeah. Mashes the vanishing cabinet. Like he's just (laughs) mischievous. Um, And then there's the opposite. There's Filch who's wandering around who I think they say is just as bad as Peeves, if not, if not worse. Because I think they say he's worse. I think they, yeah, I was going to say, I thought they said he's worse. If you worse. can imagine it. Like, it's like, he's worse yeah. if you can imagine it. Yeah, even worse than Peeves, if that was possible, was the caretaker, Argus Filch. And and then his cat, Mrs. Norris, which she has the same color eyes as Filch, which is kind of weird to begin with. Now, Okay, there, so there's the theory that she is a maledictus. I don't know if you've heard that theory. No. Because there is, because she seems to be very human-like. She has mm-hmm. more senses than a normal cat. And yeah. so does Crookshanks. So we know Crookshanks is part Kniesel. So, you know, maybe she's also part Kniesel. But I think that somewhere it says that she's all cat, somewhere that she's not Kniesel. So maybe she is all cat, but only after being a human for some time, like Nagini is a snake, but after being human for, (laughs) you know, and if she has the same color eyes as Filch, maybe she was a sister, his mother. I don't know. He really does love her though. He is incredibly attached to his cat. I think it's interesting because like nobody likes her. She's like nobody likes her. They want to kick her. And I feel bad for her. I do too. Cause I am that person who would be like, here, kitty, kitty, even to the meanest cat. Like mm-hmm. they have that meme, um, about, you know, if, if I ever get mauled by 
mauled to death by like a panther or something like that. Just know my last words are here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> that would be me because the like cats are so beautiful, even the big ones. And it's like, you go to the zoo and it's like, I want to pet the cats, mm -hmm. even if they would probably bite me. I think the coolest thing is we, um, we went to the zoo the one time and we got to hear the cheetahs meow and they meow. Like they have little meows. Like you would expect this big, no, they have this little meow and it was the cutest thing ever. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just want to take it home. It would eat me, but I want to take it home. <laughs> right. So I think I would be friends with, I think I would be friends with Mrs. Norris. I would do my best. I would curl up and just, I'd probably be friends. Give her some, her. some extra cat treats, bring some catnip, you know. Right. I could, I could bribe her and probably get away with some things. <laughs> So they really do like throw, oh, well, one other thing that, again, we don't know yet, but we will, you know, is important later on is that um, when they're talking about Filch knows the secret passages ways better than anyone, except yes. the Weasley Perhaps twins. Weasley twins, yeah. Um, which becomes a thing in the third book. Mm -hmm. um, Very much so. And then like every, like, and then it's throughout once Harry gets that map, because then he's going everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like that we kind of get like a glimpse of like their different classes. Um, you know, they, they are studying uh, astronomy. They're studying herbology, history of magic. So we, um, we meet Professor Sprout. Professor Binns, they do not talk about Professor Sinistra, even though we know that that is, we know later that is the astrology teacher. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was weird that they have class at midnight. Yeah. That on a Wednesday, like that's just such a, obviously they can't have Thursday morning classes because nobody's going to be getting any sleep, but, and it's every Wednesday at midnight. And not that the stars don't move because they do, you know, mm -hmm. but I would think there would have to be certain days that might be better for astrology yeah. than others. Um, I, I never what if it's that cloudy. But I also, I, but I always considered it with, um, with their OWL. Like, how did they know that that night was going to be clear for them to fill out those star charts? <sighs> right. Every time there's like some sort of major thing, like, the um the shooting stars and all that stuff I go out and it's cloudy every single time no. that just could be where we live I don't maybe it's clear over Scotland but I have like no they idea. said the one night we could see the aurora and it was like a storm and I was so mad mm -hmm. I was I like know. I wanted to see that I know that is something I would love to see is the northern lights like I think that'd be just so beautiful I know I oh and then Flitwick who teaches has charm. To stand on his books and he falls over when he reads Harry's name. There's got to be something better than standing on books. I know, right? <laughs> right? Like, couldn't he build himself something? Yeah. Couldn't he magic something together? Like, just books. And um, then the defense against the dark arts is a bit of a joke. Yes. Which I was wondering if it's only a joke because Voldemort doesn't want Harry to learn how to defend himself, which would be in contrast to the fourth book when we have a Death Eater teaching and he wants him to know how to defend himself. So I'm not quite sure what is going on there. I think it's more of Quirrell's cover. Like he's nervous and he's got to like hide. Um, we skipped Transfiguration. Professor McGonagall. I love, yeah, you know, like I, I, when I was reading this, two speeches, two opening speeches stuck out to me, McGonagall's and Snape's and how different they are. But mm -hmm. I love, like McGonagall is so no nonsense. I love her. She's like, she lays it out for them. So she says, transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. End of story. And yeah. then she turns her desk, in, desk into a pig and turns it back real quick. And they're all like, oh. so I'd probably be like, I had, a, I had a teacher, my French teacher was very similar to McGonagall. She, I was getting a C by the end of the first nine weeks, my freshman year. 
in French class because I was just kind of filling out the forms and like not really paying attention, whatever. I was boys were on my mind, not French class. So, um, so she pulls me aside and she says, look, you're getting to see in my class. I require you to put an effort. If you're not going to take my class seriously, you could take Spanish. And I got my act together. I got A's and B's from then on for the rest of my four years of French. And then I went on to major in French. Like, like it was, she really turned it around, but like, we got to watch videos of Saul the Clown on Fridays and it was just a lot of fun. So yeah, she, that was pretty much it. That was, she was McGonagall. She's like, if you're not going to take this class seriously, get out of here. Mm-hmm. So, and we also get our first note at Hermione is top of the class. She's the only one that makes progress on that map, turning that match into a needle. Mm-hmm. So Quirrell's turban. Yes. Is the next note I have. Mine too. That he says he gets it from a prince for getting rid of a zombie. And that it smells like garlic. They said, that, no, his classroom smells like garlic. The turban has a funny smell. Funny smell. Yeah. A funny and smell the around the turban. hypothesized that he stuffed it with garlic, but he's got right. a head, a face protruding out of his head. So... I'm sure that so, so then it kind of gets me wondering how does he just like like and if it has a smell that smell is Voldemort then so is it that he's not washing Voldemort's face or maybe he's just not brushing Voldemort's teeth like I mean because okay so we're wearing masks now and if I eat the wrong foods oh. okay so for one do you have to feed Voldemort as well to so like eat at both ends and then but yeah, but, but yeah, so when you wear your mask and you eat like something with onions on it, Ugh. your mouth, you smell that. I don't think it like necessarily goes out and other people can smell it, but definitely you can. So Voldemort with his, <laughs> he's smelling his own breath all day long. And that's got to be pretty horrible. Just. Yes. <sighs> That makes me laugh. Like, no, I'm just sitting there. Voldemort <laughs> has bad breath. <laughs> so, moving on. Yes. It is Friday in the book. And it is a big accomplishment day for them. They managed to make it to the Great Hall without getting lost. Right. And, and they, they have... have- Double potions with the Slytherins. The only class that they have with the Slytherins so far. Mm-hmm. And Ron mentions that the friend George say Snape favors the Slytherins. Let's see if this is true. <laughs> I, like I, yeah. like I wish McGonagall favored us. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which luckily he has Hagrid. Tea, tea, to, tea with Hagrid to look forward to because Hagrid sends him to the, the note and asks mm-hmm. if he would like to come around for tea and um, and Harry says yes and then but they have this class first and the second that they're in there like Snape starts doing the roll call and he instantly calls him out mm-hmm and I like how he says that um, he thought Snape disliked him. He didn't. He hated him. Yeah. And I, Snape has this menacing air. Like, he's always in black. He's, you know, dark hair, black eyes, sallow skin. I just kind of imagine him having a grumpy face. All the time, like, I don't think he smiles. He's not walking around smiling. Right. Um, I don't watch Star Wars at all, but, like, they have, like, the actor who played Anakin, maybe, and he's got, he's got a very similar look to how I imagine Snape. He's got, like, the long black hair, and... I don't watch Star Wars. I don't know. I've only, I've only seen, like, clips of him, like, on YouTube and stuff like that, and, ad, like, in commercials for Star Wars, so I don't know who he is, but I just see him and I think that looks like he could be 
Snape. Mm-hmm. Personality wise, I feel like Al Rickman nailed it. Like he yes. is Snape. And they didn't do bad with appearance. The only the only issue I have with the characters they chose is age. Mm-hmm. They would have been in their 30s. Right. And Alan Rickman was definitely not in his 30s. And I'm glad that they didn't try like the whole de-aging process thing because that mm-hmm. is just no. I'm but yes, he was supposed to be in his 30s and that just kind of throws things off a bit, but mm-hmm. not too much because the acting is just acting enough phenomenal. that you could look you look past it. Like it's, he it's is something you just look past. Maggie Smith is McGonagall. Like those two just were perfect. Oh yeah. Um, I think I've said it before. Whoever did the casting originally, like thumbs up, good job. You get an A. Yes, they did a phenomenal job. Mm-hmm. Um, so Snape goes into asking these questions. And again, we get to see our first, you know, another little glimpse of that Harry Sass first time mm-hmm. at Hogwarts. Uh, I don't know, but I think Hermione does. Why don't you ask her? Yeah. Well, Snape has it coming though. Because, yes. like, he's ignoring Hermione, ignoring him, and he's trying to call Harry out, and he's in a power struggle with an 11-year-old. Mm-hmm. Come on. <laughs> like, Snape, what, what did he think was going to happen? Snape is an incredibly complex character. There is trauma in his past. All sorts of things. But he's a jerk. Yeah. I, th- I, think, I've told, I think I told you before, like, that I read something where whatever age your trauma happened at, that's what age you're stuck at mentally. And, like, so Snape kind of being like, I'm going to pick on an 11 year old. Like that's very an 11 year old mentality. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where Snape, well, we know he had some trauma from his past with his parents fighting and stuff like that, but also all of his conflicts with James and thus leading to conflict with Lily. He does so, that to himself though. He does. He cannot continue to love Lily and hold this, that Muggleborns are trash mentality. Like you cannot, Right. There, that those two ideas, like you can never say both and it's either or. Right. <laughs> um, so like the ironic part in here is he's teasing Harry about being a celebrity and fame isn't everything. And in his speech, he talks about how he's going to teach them to bottle fame and brew glory. It's like, um, you just mock somebody for being famous. <laughs> like I, I so was pick actually a lane, dude. Do you want people? Is it okay to be famous or not? Like, I was going to read his little, uh, his little like speech. Mine's at the bottom of page one thirty six. If yours is the same, yes. And it says, "You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making." He began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word. Like Professor McGonagall, Snape had a gift of keeping a class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you to really understand the beauty of a softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind and snaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stopper death. If you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. Like, why you gotta add that? Like, it was so beautiful. Like, that it was. It was beautiful. It was so that is a beautiful speech. And it's so weird that everyone's like, everybody knows he's after the defense of Dark Art's job, but clearly he still enjoys potions to talk about them with such passion. Mm-hmm. Like, that was so poetic until calling them a bunch of dunderheads. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know, right? Like, just leave it at that. Like, I and, love that Hermione is like on the edge of her seat because she wants to prove she's not a dunderhead. <laughs> yes. And it's interesting, speaking of that, like Hermione does very, very well in potions when mm-hmm. the instructions are on the blackboard. They never pull from the potions book until book six. Yes. And I think 
it's because they don't, he doesn't want them to read what's in the book because he knows it's better if you do this instead of that, Mm -hmm. which goes against the book, which is, so he just writes it all on the board. What's interesting though, is I think that Harry doesn't put an effort in, like, I feel like if you have a teacher that clearly doesn't like you, you can do a couple different things. You can either say, I'm going to work really hard and try to make them like me. Or that's a Hermione. That's Hermione. Like yeah. Snape hates all the Gryffindors. I'm going to work really hard because I'm going to, you know, like I'm going to make this work. Very few kids are going to have that persistent attitude. Most of them are going to be like, mm-hmm. and I'm just bad at this subject. Right. I'm just that's bad the at thing this is, subject. Math. That's <laughs> the thing is like people, they, these kids aren't necessarily bad at the subject. They just don't have the right teacher. Mm-hmm. And when Neville and Seamus are working on the thing and, um, and you can see like, it's, you can't just throw things up on a board and say, follow the directions. Like you have to be clear about your expectations and say, you know, it's very important that you take your, uh, cauldron off of the flames before you add the porcupine quills, or it might explode as what happens with Seamus and Neville. Like, I don't blame them for doing that. They are first years making their very first potion. And he's just like, and then he's just like, you stupid boy. Yeah. Poor Neville. I know. It's not Neville's fault. He's got a bad teacher. And, and you also like, a, like, you know, that like they're 11. It's really yeah. easy to forget that, but they're 11. You just gave them like a fire and things that could possibly explode. And potion making. I, I always like, initially I was like, potion, making potions is kind of like cooking, but cooking there's, you know, like, unless you're doing a very delicate recipe, but most times, like if you're like a little off or you mix the ingredients in the wrong order, you may not get the best result, but you're not like, you know, sometimes it's, most of the time it's okay. Unless you're making like meringue, Mm -hmm. then I always thought of it more like chemistry. Yes. And this is why I love cooking and I'm not a fantastic chemist. I (laughs) I, I did. I did good in chemistry. I like chemistry. I thought I wanted to major in chemistry. I don't know. Like, there's too much math. Um, the chemistry itself doesn't bother me. The math really does. Um, but in lab, I remember just getting frustrated because you've got to like hold it up and make sure it's completely level and get it. And I like in one of the books that they, they were cutting up daisy roots and they had to be in equal sections. And Ron had spent like 15 minutes on his making them perfect. Right. So very much like chemistry. If you just throw them in, it's not going to work. Yeah. Stir it like so many times this way and so many times this way. And, and it would be, and like Neville's already kind of anxious because he didn't think that he was good enough to even go to Hogwarts to begin with. And then he's here. And so I think he kind of feels like he might have something to prove as well, but also he's so anxious about everything that it just kind of backfires on him. And like when Snape comes in, and he's just like, puts Harry on the spot mm-hmm. and Harry's already somebody, you know what I mean? And he's tells, and he's like drilling him. Like, why don't you know this, 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 and this already? Mm-hmm. Didn't you read? Like, I can see how that would just intimidate anybody else, especially somebody with very low confidence in mm-hmm. the classroom. Cause they could like, if he got called out, I might get called out. And then he does get called out, even though he's partnering with Seamus, like it was mm-hmm. equally them, but he's the one that Snape picks on. And I love that, like, it's, okay, so it's, Neville obviously melts the cauldron, which will not be the first time he melts a cauldron, well, or no, it won't be the last, sorry. He yeah. will do this repeatedly. He goes to pieces and potions quite regularly. Yeah. As we know. But it, Seamus is his partner, and Snape immediately turns to Harry and Ron and says, why didn't you stop him? And, <laughs> yeah. Why don't you ask his partner? Like, you, you know, you're still taking a point from Gryffindor either way, but come on <laughs> and I like how like Harry really takes it to heart like Snape took points I lost points for Gryffindor mm-hmm. then Ron's like hey he does it to Fred and George all the time don't worry about it yeah and they're only taking away like one point mm-hmm. which I think when they get into other grades like they take more so I don't know if it's just like a first year thing because they're new to this then they can't dock them as many points because they are still learning whereas like later they'll take away like 10 or 50 points 50 they lose 50 later (laughs) yeah um but like so harry says when snape's asking him all this 
you know, he says that he did look through his books at the Dursleys, but did Snape expect him to remember everything in 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi? Now, I assumed that 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi was for herbology, not potions. I assume that the book Magical Drafts of Potions was for potions. <laughs> and maybe like, because when we talked about this, when he got a set list, like they kind of overlap, but at the mm-hmm. same time, I still wouldn't ex- would expect those things to be in a different book, not this book. <laughs> I don't know. I think it would be beneficial for both because like what I envision 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi to look like is like an herbalism book. Like this is the plant. Mm-hmm. And this is the uses of the plant. So this is what you use the leaves for. You know, this is what you can do a tincture of. This is what you can do with the root. This is the possible, like, it's good for like, okay, we've got ginger root Mm -hmm. and it's anti-inflammatory. It's good for stomach maladies. It's delicious. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty much uh, like, Kind of like the uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It's just like labeled like alphabetically, but instead of beasts, it's herbs. And so it would have reference, like obviously, and I could also see it like saying like, this is how you care for them. Yeah. Like a mandrake. Yeah. And then there'd be like the warnings, like, hey, don't, don't uh, make sure your ears are covered kind of thing. I really want, see this, this this is the book I want. And I I feel like we can actually get some factuality to this because there is so much like, I mean, 1,000 1000 magical herbs and fungi, like the herbs and fungi are real things. Like, Mm -hmm. can you just, I don't know. And I mean, like, yeah, throw in some magical ones, but also all of the ones that are not magical that you still use for, like, there's enough truth behind the magic. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's actually an uh, an audio book that I have. I don't remember what it's called, but it kind of goes into the, like the real stuff that Mm -hmm. is. It, I'll have to send you the link. That would be cool. Or the title later. And maybe we'll put it in the comment section or in the description later when I when I remember oh. what it's called. But yeah, but it's cool because it actually gives like a, like a historical, like muggle perspective, I suppose. And like, and that's cool because like they actually talk about like us being muggles and it's all sorts of incorp. It's a Aww, fantastic it's listen, cool. but it's kind of uh, like- British museum-y type Ooh, of thing too. I think I'd like it. <laughs> I, I, mean, I like it, but we're both nerds. So <laughs> very much so. I used to have the Sorcerer's Companion and I'm just looking at my bookshelf where I thought it would be, but I don't see it. So I don't know where it is. I think it might be at my mom's mm-hmm. because um, this will tell you how deeply we fell into the Harry Potter thing. So our upstairs at my mom's is divided. There's five girls. So when we started, when we made the plans to build the house, there were only four girls. I will preface that then surprise there was a baby um but so there's four bedrooms an upstairs bathroom a small linen closet and an open what we had always we we had my dad had always said it was going to be like a common room and he wanted it set up in his mind was like a college dorm so that was like a common area Mm -hmm. um we took that common room (laughs) and ran with it um it has the attic pull down so that was divination the linen closet, because um, Fred and George once said that the room of requirement was the broom cupboard. So that was the room of requirement. We had, my mom got a textured stone paint and did the walls. Ooh. We had crimson curtains. There was a shelf with the monster book and an owl and a hat. That's so and cool. We had the Gryffindor common room <laughs> um, as our, as our, uh, upstairs bookshelves things like that so I think that might be where my sorcerer's companion is but it would go into like it had the like beasts and stuff and it was really a cool book and it talked a little bit about like the um like the background of each of them like mythologically and stuff like that kind of cool now I need to find that (laughs) tangent yeah um so Snape Snape hates Harry and we find out years later why Mm -hmm. I think it takes us a good six books is it six books I think we get like snippets and I think we really and genuinely I think his what I don't get I can't wrap my mind around I'm wondering like if he had looked like Lily would it have been different Mm -hmm. or if he would have been a female Mm -hmm. 
but he is like James in in the fifth book. So just listened to this actual section the other day. They he they talk about when Harry sees James in the pensive. Like it's like looking at himself with a few deliberate mistakes, different color mm-hmm. eyes, his nose is slightly shorter. But he's like the same hair, the same hands, the same face shape. Like they are almost identical. Yeah. And I feel like the animosity between Snape and James really plays into this. James was not nice to Snape. Snape had every reason to hate James. Yeah. James was very much an antagonist on a lot of situations. So, and that's what Malfoy pretty much becomes as well. Mm -hmm. So. But we have, um, other than their first interaction on the train, so we've got that interaction with James, Sirius, and Snape. And Snape, James instantly detests Snape because he was he's talking about Slytherin positively. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, then we have that one scene by the lake where they're tormenting him. But from what we hear, there's a lot more back and forth of them fighting. Yeah. So then as again, much as I, Sirius- I say... Sirius does send him down the tunnel to try to get me to werewolf. So Siri, I think Sirius is bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> but then you know, again, Sirius still... was also raised by a bunch of Slytherins too. So mm-hmm. I mean, that stuff doesn't just intrinsically come out of you all yeah. at once. Like, I mean, try as you might to not be your parents, those moments are embedded in you. Eventually, like there are gonna be times when you're you say something and you're your mom. So your the dad. other thing with Sirius is, and this is kind of, um, my husband was editing for us and he's like, I disagree. I think there's plenty of representation of, uh, of learning disabilities. And he says, exactly because Gryffindor house has most of their people have ADHD and impulsivity is one of the big hallmarks with ADHD, especially in, when they're younger. And especially in my observations, especially with boys, <laughs> like yeah. they do something and then they're like, oh yeah, I just did that. So Sna- Sirius is like, oh yeah, I just said Snape to go meet a werewolf. That mm-hmm. might not have been the best decision. <laughs> and James is like, ah! I, I did see that like in my mind's eye. I, I read something the other day, but I didn't read like the whole thing, but it was talking about how ADHD in girls just, it's there, but it manifests differently. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't, um, it's more of like internal destruction instead of external. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so it's not as noticeable. And so it just flies under the radar. People just don't notice it. So girls are- it's still, it's still pretty bad, but it, they take it out more on themselves than outwardly. And a lot of ADHD in girls looks a lot like anxiety. Mm-hmm. There's just the, I, I read it. I did an article when I was working towards my master's. I did a little bit on ADHD because that was something that was, it's relevant to me. Strong family history of it on my side. My, you know, I think I've said this, my husband had it, has it, uh, you know, just, I, I know that it's probably something that will crop up for my children and I want to be as prepared as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, moving on. Tangent. Um, we're going to tea so, at Hagrid's. Yes, and Ron wants to meet Hagrid, so he asks, you know, can can I go? I think they're they're talking about one thing, and then he just skips into the middle of it and says, um, "Oh yeah, Snape's always taking points off for Fred and Joy- George. Can I come and meet Hagrid with you?" Like he changes the subject. And I think that Ron wants to go with him to meet Hagrid because I think like all of Ron's brothers have their own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're uh, Fred and George are funny and the other ones were Quidditch captain and head boy and all all that stuff. Ron is hanging out with the cool kid, the coolest kid, the boy who lived like that is his thing is that he is popular by proxy and he does not want to lose that because it's just his thing so whatever harry does he needs to establish that connection and keep it 
So this thing with Hagrid, it's like, okay, I'm going to come with you because we're still only a week in. And yeah, like, I don't want you to make friends without me. Like you need to be my right. friends. Yeah. And it's a well, very your friends friendship. friendship my friends, we're going to roll in the same circle always. So I think that's why Ron asked. And I don't want to be like, he's super selfish, but like, or that it's, he's doing They're it 11 and trying to or anything fun. like that, you know, but he, but you know, he just yeah. is, I think he is. So and we all kind of do that when and, and well, whatever we want, we, we kind of do, you know, just like, Hey, it's not like, Hey, I'm coming. And I'm, it's not very take charge. It's just, can I, cause I yeah, want this. I think it's kind of like a, you know, they need to cultivate a common interest in things, you know, oh, my friend, and I have a child that is around this age. So it's really interesting. Like my friends are into this. Mm -hmm. So now I might be into this. Right. I'm very much still like that. Like, oh, you're into that. What is that? Mm -hmm. And like exploring it more. And it's like, is that something that I'm into? Maybe, maybe not. And got to try it to know if you're into it or not. So, and so they go off to Hagrid's. I love Hagrid's. I love, love, love Hagrid's. It's probably like if you had to like, if I had to pick some of my favorite spots in the castle, Hagrid's hut. And, you know, if I ever won the lottery, I want a self-sustaining farm with a tiny house. And my family says, well, we'll come visit you sometime (laughs) because we're going to have a real house over here. (laughs) Um, I love that like rustic kind of feel you know, he's got the pheasants and the patchwork quilt. It's very homey. It's very like little house on the prairie cabiny feel. And I just, I like that. That's very me. That's very not me. <laughs> I'm like, he's got one room. It seems crowded. It seems cramped. Where is his toilet? Um, like, I didn't wonder that. Um, but yeah, I'm just like, chickens inside the house hang it no that's not for me that's not for me I love um it's with especially with this big slobbery dog like the drool would be everywhere couldn't do it it'd be too much just with the dog alone (laughs) like oh I love Fang I would love to have a Mastiff my sister had one and they are just big babies they're lovey 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 things my um, my friend had a St. Bernard and it was a very loving dog, but I was covered in drool all the time. I couldn't do it. It's so gross. My, I got a baby that does that. Like, <laughs> and it's not even nearly as much as St. Bernard when she's teething. So, and she'll grow out of that. St. Bernard's <laughs> don't. They're always, and like the bigger they get, the more they drool. Ugh. No, thanks. I'm a cat person anyway. Y'all saw the cat. <laughs> so... You like Mrs. Norris over Fang any day. I'm sorry. And Hagrid is a bad cook. Yes, Hagrid is a bad cook. We they we established this multiple times <laughs> throughout the series. Hagrid is a bad cook. I so I did not know what rock cakes were. Um, I Googled it because I because when they're like rock cakes and they're hard, and I was like thinking to myself. Yeah. Yeah. They're called rock cakes. cakes. So apparently they, what they look like to me is like some sort of mix between a cookie and a scone. Ooh. And that actually sounds good. And they were promoted during world war II because they required less eggs and less sugar and they had dry dried fruits in them. So I feel like they've got raisins. I kind of picture them as like lumpy giant oatmeal raisin cookies. Very. Yeah. Something's very similar to that. So while I was at it, I looked up what humbugs and Yorkshire pudding looked like because I was from the I was at the last chapter or the chapter before we talked about last it. Chapter. And I was like, what are these things? So I do know that humbugs are now like a toffee flavored mint. And Yorkshire pudding is like what we would call a popover, which I still haven't even heard of. Oh, which I love is pretty popovers. much just a buttery pastry. So mm-hmm. I'm like that's okay. what I thought. I said, I think that and you can put gravy on them. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> like, you never like dipped your roll in gravy? No. <gasps> well, I guess I've had like uh, biscuits and gravy. 
Yeah, but if you're like you're having mashed potatoes and gravy and you've got a roll like on Thanksgiving, oh, you can, like yeah. sop up it's that so extra it's... gravy with the the roll. So is it more of like is it more of like a just because there's different kinds of biscuits, like in general, like like you got your dinner biscuits and you got your breakfast biscuits. They're two different biscuits. And I think they're more like a savory, like a like a roll, like a dinner roll kind of thing. Okay. But you could probably it might be like a crepe. Like a crepe is pretty neutral. You can put savory stuff in it or you can put sweet stuff in it same thing with like a buttermilk biscuit you can jam on it or you can put sausage gravy on it Mm, okay I I guess I apparently need to try more foods but I am just not I'm not a good cook I am like Hagrid my rock cakes would probably taste like rocks um I am a pretty bad cook so I like to cook my pretty limited in in what I make and what I'm exposed to too because I'm also a picky eater I like food (laughs) I like food I'm just what I what I eat and what I like is just not a lot I used to be an incredibly adventurous eater and now I have to be careful and I don't like it allergies (sighs) so fang is this big baby. (laughs) We established that Fang is a big baby multiple times later on, but he just like, oh, he's not as fierce as he looks, kind of like Hagrid. Yeah. Now Hagrid says he'd like to introduce Mrs. Norris to Fang sometime, but Fang would probably just sniff her and maybe lick her or something like that. But, and it's weird because Hagrid loves all animals and but not Mrs. Norris. Not Mrs. Norris. No sympathy for her. Well, because Filch... Filch is, you know, he, he says, I think Filch puts her up to it. Filch has mm-hmm. said, don't like him, follow him around. He might cause trouble, even though Agar does not cause trouble. What if she just knows that he's very good with animals and wants to be around him? Mm. And then like, and poor Mrs. Norris is like, I can't even make friends with the guy who loves all <laughs> animals. Poor Mrs. Norris. See, always take the side of the cat. And I love how Ron is another Weasley. Yeah. That's oh, got to make him feel Weasley. good. Oh, another Weasley. <laughs> like a, I love Hagrid's exaggeration here. I spent half my life chasing your brothers away from that forest. You spent yeah. the past two years. <laughs> probably seems like a long time because he probably is doing that a lot. I'm sure. Fred and George are such troublemakers. I love they it. They are. Um... And then he gets on to talking about Charlie and working with animals and doing. But Charlie dragons. is the distraction. Talking yeah. about Charlie is the distraction because Harry says, I don't think Snape likes me. And Hagrid says, that's rubbish and changes the subject. Mm-hmm. Like, quick. So they're talking about Charlie and Harry's reading the newspaper clipping that's on the table. Yes. And this is our second big clue. I know. I just love that these clues are coming out about who it could be and all that stuff. And it's like, well, we don't know it yet. What's interesting is in our minds, if we were like, hey, who else was in Diagon Alley on July 31st? It was not Snape. Right. We saw Quirrell, who had to have left the Leaky Cauldron after Hagrid and Harry, which is why they got there first. Um, so now I started thinking, cause this, cause I know like this opens up so many questions for Harry and it opened up some questions for me too. Like how long was the stone in that vault? So like, what was that window of opportunity that it could have gotten stolen and how did Quirrell even know about it being there and being in that specific vault vault to know which one to rob to begin with? And we know that they had to have had an idea that it was under threat or Dumbledore wouldn't have told Flamel, hey, you need to get it out of there. Right. So does Dumbledore still have this network of spies? Does, you know, how much does Dumbledore know? Or is it just kind of those, this might happen, we should do this. Like, is it all just intuition and inkling and maybes? Because there's got to be something that Dumbledore knows about Voldemort being active to want to know to move that stone. Mm -hmm. And then, and we know later that he tells 
Snape to keep an eye on Quirrell. Which makes no so, sense. If you are suspecting Quirrell, why aren't you doing something about it? Like something more right? serious about it. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Harry almost, has class with that guy. It almost kills him. Like, come on. Like there's a risk. Like, yes, let children take risks, but that's a pretty big one to be like, yeah, go take your chances. Right. And I don't think we're at that point yet where, because I, I read in, in the next few chapters, I, I read ahead a little bit. So we get to a point where I think, I wonder if that's the turning point on what lets Dumbledore let Harry take that chance at the end of the book. So I think, I think we see that turning point in the next few chapters. I think it's the one at the troll. Because Harry's already kind of, I think at that point, Harry's proving that he wants to be the one to go and save people. Yeah. And I think after that, then Dumbledore's like, if he's, I think that's in my mind, that shows Dumbledore that he is ready to want to be able to take that risk for himself to kind of And vindicate. we can arguably like, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the chapter with the troll. Yeah. But how does Dumbledore miss that as a, like, we don't know until later that Quirrell's good with trolls, but like, how do you miss that? Like, yeah. Let in a troll. Hmm. How long has he kept up this like poor stuttering Quirrell thing? Like, did he get hired before he went abroad? Cause I think you mentioned this before. Like, did he work at Hogwarts, but then take the year off and then come back. And then he, when he came back, he was this poor stuttering professor Quirrell act because he saw Voldemort. And how and, good of an Aquamens is he? Because Dumbledore is very Dumbledore and Snape are both very skilled at legitimacy. Right. And he so, just lets, you know, fools them both. Yeah. I don't know. I don't well, but then again, Draco is good enough by in the sixth book that he can block out Snape. Mm-hmm. So so somebody who's teaching defense against the dark arts should be able to. It also baffles me that Harry is not good at occlumency but again I think it has to do with teacher yeah I probably think he wants to work with Snape yeah I think that if if like Lupin were to try to teach him occlumency I think he could get it yeah Harry's actually a lot smarter than I think like we give him credit for yeah but um and, and so so then all of these questions come out and it, we are left on a cliffhanger chapter again so I don't know if you want to read those last questions yeah I'll read those questions because like, I actually so, I, read, I jotted them down in my notes and I put it like a star next to I'm like oh my gosh the questions the questions right um so I'll just read this I'll read the last like little chunk as Harry and Ron walked back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed down with rock creeks they'd been too polite to refuse. Harry thought that none of the lessons he'd had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package just in time? Where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? Yes. <laughs> Hogwarts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. But like, but when you're reading it for the first time, you're just like, yeah, what and, about all those things? And I love that it really, again, it's beautifully written because it does uh, automatically we link Snape to that thing with the Gringotts mm-hmm. because those questions are linked, yes. but not necessarily, they were actually referring to two different things. such a good setup for Snape he's I know and I love it so so the difference between the audiobooks and the books um some of the verbiage cueing versus lining up Mm -hmm. um when they're seeing when they're trying to see Harry lessons versus classes um the at one point it's the only class taught by a ghost versus the only one taught by a ghost I don't know why they changed some of these things that's weird Register versus roll call. Um, another one that's kind of weird one. They're making notes versus they're taking notes. So I guess, because we always take notes, but I guess in British, they make notes, huh. which is interesting. We get post versus mail again. Um, in the audiobook, um, it says, dear Harry, before it says, it said in a very untidy scrawl. 
So, like, in the book, when Haggard writes his letter, oh, there's, like... And I wonder if that's an audiobook difference or if that's a reading difference. Like, I don't know if we had, like, the British print, if I would say that. Yeah. Because, like, we can read the note. Right. So, so I don't know if that's in the... If that's... Because that's the thing is, I assume that Stephen Fry is reading the UK version, like, because he does read the... Uh, the Philosopher's Stone, not the Sorcerer's Stone. So mm-hmm. I don't know if it's the difference between the books or a difference between the audiobook and the book. So I assume it's between the the books because I would assume oh, yeah. that but he I would read it if that verbatim. was a reading issue, like if that was something he read differently because of you can't see, like in, in the book, we, we, can, we can see the note. Yeah. Whereas if you're listening to it. You could still... Even in an audiobook, it's said in a very untidy scrawl, Dear Harry. At like I and then go on. I would love to see like Harry. Print, if right. it like actually shows it as a note or if it's just part of the text. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't see yeah, that's why I don't know. I like that it has the um and mine's unfortunately split on a separate page here. I don't know if you can see it, but like it's got the yeah, the notes like, the, the notes in a different font and everything like that. Mm-hmm. So um in the book it adds a sentence about the rock cakes oh um, probably because we don't, don't know what the rock cakes are so um it says the rock cakes were shapeless lumps with raisins that almost broke their teeth and but but in the in the audio book stone they don't have that yeah again they left that out I, i'm assuming that's probably that's, just because it's another British food. Maybe that's why I didn't bother to like, cause I, ne- it never occurred to me like, Hey, maybe I should look up what rock cakes actually are because to me, they're a shapeless lump with raisins. In them. Yeah. Cause, cause no, I, I just you that description, description, but I'm like, I've never heard of a rock cake before or outside of these books. So it's like, whenever I don't know what that is, it's like, even if you describe it to me, it's like, I'm more visual. Like I want to see what that is. So like a Knickerbocker glory, I know that's an ice cream, but it sounds glory like you know what I mean I want to see it I'm auditory I'm primarily auditory and then secondary visual so like for me like that is enough like what I think it is but that was it was a relatively short chapter so there weren't too many differences between them I did notice that it was a shorter chapter like we've had some really long chapters and I was like I was reading this one I'm like and I'm done (laughs) right the next one's a bit longer. Yeah, I think the next one's like almost like 20 some pages. Then we have a shortish one. Yeah. I'm looking at the titles going, oh, oh, I can't wait to talk about that. Oh, I can't wait to talk about that. I know. I read the next I read the next two and I don't have as many notes on those, but I think there's still going to be enough to talk about. We always seem to be able to, to drag out more than what our notes actually have in here. Right. So I think that covers this chapter. Yep, that's our perspective. So let us know yours in the comments below. Before we go, we would like to thank our editor, Alan, our families, our listeners, and remember to like, share, subscribe, and support. Until next time, stay safe, keep faith, good night.